by the medical team a warm welcome to all of you in another series of i trust webinar i trust webinar series aims to foster knowledge exchange promote interdisciplinary collaboration and exchange patient care across various medical domains today we have great privilege of hosting a distinguished guest who is an expert in the field of critical care and diabetes management please join me in extending a heartfelt welcome to dr adhidya verma welcome sir thank you sir dr verma we are honored to have you here today to share your expertise on the topic managing hyperglycemia in critical care setup as we all know hyperglycemia is a critical issues that affects a significant number of patients in intensive care unit it requires a specialized knowledge and attention to effectively manage this condition and ensures the best possible outcome for our patients doctor we have our he is a teacher and guide in of dm endocrinology department of endocrinology in in index medical college and pg institute indore mp in india he is director at seva that is super specialty endocrinology and women care center he is the consultant endocrinologist in verma hospital indore mp he has more than 35 publications in national and international index journal he is the reviewer in six national and four international journals of diabetes obesity gynecology child health and nutrition etc he has received several awards like charak awards in 2021 uh, dr sk khanijo imp award and excellence in endocrinology and diabetes in 2017 his work was appreciated during the covid pandemic by red cross society in the so not taking much time of you i will uh, request uh, dr ajindya verma sir to start his presentation so over to you sir yes thank you amarjit ji uh, so can i have the uh, this thing the control of slides Yeah, can yeah. I have control of slides? Okay, sir. So I I will stop sharing and uh, you share, sir. If you feel okay. any difficulties, sir, you just tell me. I will uh, share uh, on behalf of you. Okay. Yes, yes. You 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 can uh, stop. Yes, I will I will do it. You know. So okay. thank you, Amarjit ji. And uh, uh, at the outset, I like to uh, thank. Uh, so is it visible? Yes, sir. Yes. So at the outset, I like to thank the. Uh, team bocard for giving me this opportunity uh to talk on this very uh, common and a very uh, day to day uh, we can say um a problem which we face in our uh, diabetology uh, practice the management of hyperglycemia in critical care set up so a lot of times see we do in opd a uh, blood sugar management sometimes the patients they follow and the sugars are controlled sometimes the sugars are not controlled but in opd they don't have much problems they may complain but then the real test of blood sugar control is seen in critical care setup and we all are there in management of hyperglycemia so we have to take care of our opd ipd patients and critical care patients also especially when they are hospitalized and their condition is critical whether the condition is critical due to a cardiac problem a stroke a septicemia or a kidney disease we have to manage hyperglycemia because hyperglycemia can lead to adverse hospital outcomes in our critical 
patients. So, what is hyperglycemia in a hospitalized patient? We all know hyperglycemia is increase in blood sugar, but what is it? So, it is basically any hyperglycemia or any blood sugar levels above 140 mg per deciliter in the hospital setting. So this is very important to understand. You know? Sometimes we see 160, 117 hospital care setting. We say, okay, no problem. Think of some other thing. No. Anything above 140 in a hospital setting is hyperglycemia. Yes, it may not be diabetes. We should try to understand hyperglycemia and diabetes are two different things because hyperglycemia is just increase in the blood sugar levels. But diabetes is kind of a chronic disease. So the hyperglycemia, which may be transient phenomena also, can be due to stress. And it is known as stress hyperglycemia due to various reasons because of infections, because of stress due to a cardiac problem, a stroke. So, elevation of blood glucose level during hospital stay with no prior history of diabetes. And very important thing here we should get a HbA1c. And if it comes less than 6.5%, you can say that the person is not having diabetes. He or she is having stress-induced hyperglycemia because the HbA1c levels are normal. And the hyperglycemia, which is more than 140, is due to the stress. But then, on the other hand, if we get a HbA1c more than 6.5%, then it suggests that this is a frank diabetes, whether diagnosed or undiagnosed. And if diagnosed already, a person is already a known diabetic, then there is no, no, no confusion, no problem. But if it is detected first time, more than 6.5% the HbA1c levels, it says that the person was a diabetic, maybe undiagnosed because of several reasons. And now he should be treated as per a diabetic. Patient. So, this we should understand clearly so that we can plan ahead our total therapies regarding hyperglycemia during the hospital stay of the patient. So, these are some of the commonly said and used classifications of hyperglycemia during hospitalization. As I have already talked to you about the previously diagnosed diabetes or hyperglycemia, it is the existing hyperglycemia prior to hospitalization, which we all know. The patient says, Ki, sir, I am a diabetic since last 5, 7 years or 10 years. But yes, in India, we know we have a lot of patients who are undiagnosed also, who are having diabetes. So, Whenever we get at admission a fasting sugar more than 126, random blood glucose more than 200 and HbA1c more than 6.5% and the person doesn't know, he is not on therapy, he is said to have a previously undiagnosed diabetes. And when we say that the patient has got stress hyperglycemia, when the admission HbA1c is less than 5.7%. Or in fact, I would say if it is less than 6.5 also, we say that the person is at least 
not having a over diabetes maybe a pre diabetic person and because of stress we all know there are a lot of counter regulatory hormones produced which can lead to stress induced hyperglycemia but during hospitalizations they'll have typical hyperglycemia fasting more than 126 random sugars more than 200 but after discharge this is also important it's not only during the hospitalization and the critical care we have to follow up the patient and if post discharge also when the patient has become normal he or she is doing the routine activities still if the blood sugar levels remain in a normal range then we say that this is stress hyperglycemia so these three conditions we need to know very clearly and accurately so that we don't misdiagnose and we don't leave the patient untreated after they go out from the hospital so in this you can see the prevalence of hyperglycemia and critically ill patients this was a prospective observational study done on about 1000 patients published in intensive care medicine and it shows that here critical illness associated hyperglycemia was seen in about 50% of the patients so here you can see and maybe if we go more into the detail, more into the depth of their hyperglycemia, we may find that these patients are kind of pre-diabetic patients who are just on the verge of becoming diabetes and the stress or critical illness has exposed the diabetes or hyperglycemia in these patients. So this provides us a window also to diagnose the future diabetic to help them manage and take care of the impending over diabetes also. And 22% patients, they already have diabetes, unrecognized diabetes, almost 5.5%. First time, they already had diabetes, but it was diagnosed first time and 22.7% normal glycemia. So here you can see when we talk about the normal blood glucose level, it is only maybe one fourth, maximum one fourth, but three fourth has or had some kind of hyperglycemia whether recognized not recognized or stress induced so this makes it more important to check regularly the blood sugar levels in critical illness patients and this is what the increased blood sugar levels or hyperglycemia causes in our critical ill patients increased blood sugar levels you can see the percentage predicted mortality it rises significantly so whenever there is a hyperglycemia it is significantly associated with increased mortality in both the patients who were diagnosed with diabetes or who were not diagnosed with diabetes. So this is important. You know? This doesn't matter. Forget discussing, forget talking about that this patient is diabetic or not. This patient uh, uh, should be treated as diabetic or not. Or this is just stress-induced hyperglycemia. Any hyperglycemia, whether diagnosed, undiagnosed, should be treated aggressively in critical ill patients and studies have shown again this was a 2009 article from critical care medicine which showed mortality risk is greater in those without diabetes so if it is diagnosed first time hyperglycemia 
in undiagnosed patients or who does not have diabetes in them mortality is even more higher because their body may not be capable of taking care of the problems associated with hyperglycemia so in patients who already have diabetes we have to take care of diabetes but then who does not have diabetes and they have hyperglycemia during critical care illness we have to be more vigilant and aggressive also and yes we all know a very good article published almost two decades back in nagm showed the difference between conventional sugar control and a intensive sugar control in icu setting which showed that intensive sugar control reduced significantly the mortality compared to conventional so conventional is here we are giving treatment in conventional also but it's not aggressive the sugars are not up to the target range so even a slightest hyperglycemia those ranges will discuss we'll see that what all this thing what is the exact range so if we are quite relaxed in our approach that okay the sugars are okay treat not to treat little bit treat if we are in a confusion and we don't go for a intensive or aggressive blood sugar control it may have increased mortality and here you can see with good sugar control intensive treatment the mortality was almost half it was just 4.6 percent compared to 8 percent in the conventional treatment group and this is a very old landmark study and this is another description you can see in surgical ICU. The effect of average blood glucose also. It's not the only one-time sugar. But if like somebody stays for 10 days, 5 days, we see the average blood sugar levels. We say, okay, sometimes it is 100, sometimes it is 180, sometimes it goes 140, sometimes two, above 200 also. But when the average is more than 150 we can see the cumulative percent of mortality in hospital death is quite higher compared to a very intensive therapy or blood glucose less than 110 but then here also we have some two different thoughts a very tight sugar controlled versus a relaxed or conventional approach to sugar control and if we keep the blood sugar levels between 110 to 150 yes there were benefits seen and in fact few studies have shown that if we go for a very tighter control the hypoglycemias may increase the risk of cardiovascular deaths in cardiac patients so this was actually a a 20 year old study and after that studies have come in 2009 and 10 which have shown that very tight sugar control may in fact so i think 110 less than 110 is not uh, uh, okay it's not that uh, uh, practical and may increase the risk of mortality especially the cardiac mortality but still here, studies have shown, again, we can talk about the ranges, but good sugar control. I won't say intensive sugar control as they have shown less than 120 average blood sugar, but a good sugar control. And the range we will, we will see in the coming slides that a good sugar control reduces the morbidity and mortality in all the spectrum of the patients whether it's a sepsis patient whether a patient is on dialysis whether post op patient blood transfusion polyneuropathy everywhere you can see 
a significant 34 to 50 percent of reduction in morbidity and mortality. So here they say, again, I would say, don't take this level seriously, 80 to 110, because now we have studies which are a little bit more relaxed. 80 to 120, 110 is quite, quite, quite tight. You know, and we don't use it nowadays, but still good sugar control helps. And here, what is the basic reason of hyperglycemia? You know, we will we, we sometimes say, yes, maybe a just transient increase in blood sugar levels, and it it will all be okay after the patient gets discharged. But then we should know that what are the things happening which lead to increased blood sugar level in a patient. So, when there is an absolute or relative insulin deficiency, so here you mind this thing, the absolute or relative insulin deficiency, which means that the person is in the borderline range or in a pre-diabetes range, he or she has already some insulin secretory defect. And on top of that, when there is stress, there are increased counter-regulatory hormones, which leads to increased lipolysis and the adipose tissue, the free fatty acids, they go to liver, they cause increase in glucose output, glyconogenolysis, we have increased protein breakdown, reduced glucose utilization in the peripheral tissues and ultimately all these along with the patients receiving glucocorticoids for various reasons, catecholamines, the parenteral, enteral nutrition, and the stress-induced increase in the pro-inflammatory cytokines, they all lead to hyperglycemia, leading to various circulatory and electrolytes effect, reduction in nitric oxide, superoxide generation, platelet activation, endothelial dysfunction, mitochondrial injury, and all leading to increased sepsis and multi-organ failure and increased incidence of death or mortality. So here you see that a patient with hyperglycemia, he goes through all these stages where each and every organ of the body is involved. Lot of metabolic disturbances happen directly or indirectly leading to multi-organ failure and even death in a critical patient. So that's why it is important to take care of hyperglycemia because it's not only the number of blood sugar levels, it is basically the showing or pointing to something that all these things are happening in the patient's body and by controlling blood sugar levels, we would be taking care of all these direct and indirect effects of body and the drugs, medications which a patient is receiving. But then we all know that better said than done. That there are a lot of barriers. It is not so easy to manage blood sugar levels in our critical care settings because of various barriers like diet. We know critical care patients' diet may be variable. The timings may be variable. So, problem, when to give insulin, how much to give insulin, how to monitor. And then we have nothing by mouth before the procedure. So, how to manage a slight increase in hyperglycemia when the patient is totally nil by mouth. And then the use of enteral and parenteral nutritional support where, again, the dose, the quantity, the condition of the patient, the absorptions, they all interfere or they all 
cause fluctuations in the blood sugar levels. Then the medications, as I've told, catecholamines, the uh, glucocorticoids may themselves not help us to control the blood sugar levels. Potential drug to drug interactions, again a problem. Physiological factors of acute illness, stress, impaired renal functions, impaired uh, uh, the uh, uh, GI absorption of various drugs and even the uh, nutrition, all these things. And obviously I would say monitoring, monitoring and monitoring. It requires a regular monitoring and a regular chart. It is not only you take a random blood sugar level anytime whenever we go for rounds or whenever we, it should be monitored properly. Then only we would be able to understand about the effect of that drug, effect of the diet and various other parameters also. So here monitoring will definitely help us a lot. So how to manage the hyperglycemia in hospital settings. Obviously, we know we have both insulin therapy and oral antidiabetic agents. But I would say any critical patient not on regular meals, the diet quantity is not confirmed. Patient is on various medications which can fluctuate the blood sugar levels. Insulin is always recommended the best therapy in very critical patients in ICU we should be giving only IV insulins but then the patients who are not so critical they have some kind of fixed meal timings and fixed meal they may take subcutaneous insulin therapy, but it is always insulin therapy. I would say even in normal ward patients, when you see the sugars are not okay, the patient may or may not be eating, maybe just because of simple enteric fever also, it is always better to give the insulin therapy. Maybe subcutaneous, not IV, but they are better than oral antidiabetic agents. And these are the various guidelines. So here you can see the target blood sugar levels, what we should keep. As I was saying earlier, 80 to 120 is quite intensive, but then you see that various organizations from 2009 to 2021, whether it's a American Association of Clinical Endocrinology, Surviving Sepsis, American College of Physicians, Society of Critical Care, RSSDI from India, Canada Diabetes Association, and American Diabetes Association. They somehow say in all these ICU patients that 140 to 180 is the ideal range for our critical ill patients in ICU. So, type test range around 140. Patients where the sugars, chances of hypoglycemia are more, who don't need very tight control, we can go up to 180. So, 140 to 180 is the most recognized range all over the world now for blood sugar control in our critical care patients. So, when we should start acting in our critical ill patients, when the blood sugar level goes above 180. Critical ill patients, IV started, maintain the blood sugar levels between 140 to 180, lower 110 to 140 may be appropriate in selected patients. The young patient and quite stable, meals are okay, the timings of meal are okay. We can go for 110, 140 because it definitely gives more benefit than keeping it between 140 to 180. But targets less than 110 are not recommended. 
and more than 180 are not recommended. So this is the lowest and the highest range, 110 and 180. Yes, 110 to 140 in selected patients where monitoring is good, patient is quite stable. Yes, acceptable, but otherwise recommended. 140 to 180 should always and in all patient be the target of treatment and whether IV or subcutaneous we know critical care patients they have a lot of problems they may have hypotension also they may have uh, other problems also where absorption from subcutaneous tissue may not be very you can say uh, a, a kind of linear or appropriate so we choose to give iv route of administration because it can rapidly start acting and control the blood sugar levels. For this, we should have a good insulin protocols made specially for our settings. So it should be easily ordered whenever if you are sitting in your clinic also and the patient gets admitted in ICU, you should be very comfortable to order it and obviously it should be effective also to control blood sugar levels with minimal risk of hypoglycemia easy to understand for the nursing or the junior staff and it should be able to use in your hospital widely so it's not only that ICU trained staff should be able to understand and implement it if the patient is shifted because of some reason to other wards, maybe from medical to surgical, then also it should be easy to implement and should obviously be effective also. So when we go for IV insulin versus subcutaneous insulin when the sugars are really very high uncontrolled diabetes stress due to infections pressures severe pain patients who have undergone cardiac surgery any transplant surgery when the lady is in labor or going for delivery patients who are on high dose of steroids and patients who require dextrose containing therapies which constantly keeps the blood sugar levels on higher side so and more than this also we have the the uh, uh, indications but these are some of the indications recently published in 2020 that at least in these patients which should be sure about iv insulin first insulin and iv insulin must for these patients and then we may again discuss or argue with the protocols. There are several protocols of insulin infusion published which are quite safe and effective with low rates of hypoglycemia like Yale protocol, the CUP, RBH, Portland protocol. But I would say, see, basically these are according to the, the, uh, the conditions there the facilities of the institution. If we practice regularly critical care medicine and take care of ICU patients, we should make our own protocol according to the facilities available, the staff, the, the, uh, 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 the kind of patients we get. So we should try to make, but yes, these protocols study may help us to implement those things in our ICU setting. So exact protocol is probably less important. What is important is its presence in an institution. So first we have to make a protocol. It should always be there so that any patient comes, our staff, they start using the 
protocol and adaptation to individual hospital need is also important. So what can we do for patients admitted to hospital? Nilba mouth. For all diabetic patients, we can go with finger stick, blood glucose estimation, all admissions, check if they are taking steroids, they are diagnosed diabetic patients or not, according to blood sugar levels, as we have already seen, we may see that the blood sugar levels are high, immediately start treatment, hb on c will help us to say whether this patient is a diagnosed or undiagnosed diabetic. So, any patient, critical care in ICU, blood sugar levels above 40, start insulin therapy with rapid acting insulin and not on subcutaneous therapy and start with 0.5 units per hour. And if the patient is stable, blood glucose levels are okay, patient is out of the danger, hemodynamically stable, then we can start a subcutaneous long-acting insulin like glargine also, which definitely takes care of the sugar fluctuation. Like if some patient is requiring a short-acting insulin, 4-4 four, four units, two times, three times daily. And if we start this patient on eight or 10 units of subcutaneous glargine, we may have a stable sugar control and the patient may not require the bolus doses, four, four units before a meal or even after the meal. And then if we really feel that patient is stable, eating properly, we may start the bolus insulin therapies along with glargine according to the postprandial blood sugar levels. So how we start IV insulin? It is not for type 1 diabetic patients or diabetic ketoacidosis or hyperglycemic osmolar states. But step one is start the insulin infusion, 100 units in 100 ml of 0.9% normal saline. And for this, we can use a regular insulin as part blue lysine or Lispro. So, a regular insulin or a designer insulin, a short or rapid acting insulin. And if the blood glucose levels are above target, we should keep on checking it and increasing the dose of the insulin. If the patient does not have diabetes or if he or she is receiving less than one unit, then we may discontinue. So it may be just maybe because the patient has taken some dextrose already, the patient is given sugar already. So it may, they may have stress-induced hyperglycemia for a couple of hours. If the requirement is less, we can stop also. And if we feel the patient has become stable, we may start the first dose of subcutaneous basal insulin like glargine also. And in between, if we require, we can give a dose of faster acting insulin analogs or rapid acting insulin also. Step three, we can give initially a bolar dose also to control the blood sugar level rapidly. Like if somebody's blood sugar level is 174, we divide it by 100, which comes to 1.74. And if we round it to 1.5, so we can give this patient 1.5 units bolus and start insulin infusion immediately at the rate of 1.5 units per hour. And intravenous fluids also should be given to maintain the equilibrium 5 to 10 grams of glucose per hour by dextrose 5% or dextrose half normal saline at rate of 100 to 200 ml per hour or if nutrition can be given to the patient TPN or enteral feeding can be given and then next step 
we have to keep on adjusting the infusion. So if the blood sugar levels are not well controlled, we can go to step one again or else step two. In patients, especially like post-CAB sometimes or organ or islet transplant because of glucocorticoids, they may require insulin doses more than 80 units per day. And in those patients, we can go for next step. And this is algorithm 1 and algorithm 2. So here, this is just dose of insulin. You can see according to the blood sugar levels. Don't take it as it is. You can change it according to your settings, according to the patient's condition also. But start with 0.5. If it is lesser than that, sugar drops below 110, we may stop or we may reduce from 0.5 to 0.2. But as the blood sugar level increases, we can increase the infusion 1, 1.52 or somewhere you can see in severe insulin resistant patient algorithm 2, we can directly jump by 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. We may not go for the 0 0.5, 0 0.5 units increment also. So here you can see more than 360 in insulin sensitive patients, we may go with six units per hour. But in patients who are severely insulin resistant, who are on glucocorticoids, we may have to go up to 12 units per hour. So critical ill patients, one hourly estimation, sugar's okay, go for two hourly estimation. Sugar is okay, maintaining range every 4 hours for consecutive 24 hours and keep on increasing the duration of testing if the blood sugar levels are maintained. And we can make it thrice or four times daily, the, especially the blood sugar levels pre-meal. And then according to those readings, we can give the insulin therapy to the patient. And if the patient goes to the ward, we can make from this IV to subcutaneous insulin. So whenever we feel that in patient is getting 0.5 units per hour IV insulin and the patient is stable, we can start the long-acting insulin glargine. And one thing to note, when we start insulin glargine, it should be started at least two hours before we stop the IV insulin. Sometimes what we do, we stop insulin, IV insulin, and we give the subcutaneous insulin. So in between two to three hours, there is increase in hyperglycemia because the glargine starts acting after two to three hours. So we have to have that buffer time. Give it two hours before stopping the IV insulin so that the blood sugar levels are maintained after we stop IV insulin. And some centers start long-acting insulin on initiation of IV insulin. So we can start both in stable patients start IV insulin and give some amount of the subcutaneous basal insulin also so that the fluctuations are less but it is only in stable patients. So this is again important what can we do for patients admitted to hospital we have to document the diagnosis so everything should be written and informed to the treating paramedics also that all the hyperglycemias in our critical care setting or even in a hospital setting is diabetes until unless it is proven. So every increased blood sugar level treat it as you are treating a diabetic patients and bring to all the treating doctors attention. Note all the problems on the list and the face sheet. Check HbA1c levels. Hold oral antidiabetic agents, especially metformin and thiazolidine diets. And start insulin in all hospitalized patients.
as i said earlier also not only critical not only icu patients even in ward when you see the patient is not okay not eating properly even with enteric fever start insulin therapy if the blood sugar levels are not well controlled and the best is a basal insulin glargine which is quite stable no peak takes care of the glycemic variability very well and less chances of hypoglycemia is there obviously diabetes education when the patient gets stable to him and the family people also instruct them about regular monitoring and recording it also and make a individualized treatment program before the discharge and inform them how to check when to check the blood sugar levels and for this it is important that before discharge we ask them to get a glucometer and tell them to start using it during hospitalization also and after they get discharge start monitoring and come with those record during the follow up also thank you thank you so much sir that was a uh, really uh, as we could say uh, uh, we all i'm sure all our participants have uh, learned a lot because it was really in depth uh, the management of hyperglycemia uh in critical care and then how to stage it further uh moving to the wards and even uh discharges sir thank uh, you the, uh, so the floor is open for questions uh so we request all that in least if you have any question you can put it in the chat box meanwhile sir it was really interesting to see uh the one of the slide that you showed that uh there's definitely increase in the mortality uh when there is hyperglycemia but those who had uh, previously diagnosed diabetes they had slightly lesser mortality as compared to those who were just diagnosed when they admitted if you would like to throw some light on that sir yes definitely a lot of studies have shown they have confirmed uh, this also it was just a uh, uh... data from one study but see basically it's like uh, more of the adaptation you uh, i would say that people who are diagnosed with diabetes they 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 adjust well with the variations in the blood sugar levels their 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 vital organs the target organs are somehow tuned to the fluctuations in the blood sugar levels but a person who is recently diagnosed Uh, having hyperglycemia and that too in a higher range maybe because of the the uh, stress itself maybe because of the medications the body takes time to adjust and especially uh, studies have shown that in these patients along with uh, the stress uh, uh, as a, a cofactor there is higher amount of pro inflammatory markers which have got more a uh, deleterious effect in the patients who are newly diagnosed or who have first time hyperglycemia whether they were diagnosed or not diagnosed so i think it's like the adaptation in diabetic patients uh, adaptation is more rapid and the body is more tuned to hyperglycemia but in a newer patient uh, the patient's body is not uh, ready for the uh, challenges of hyperglycemia uh definitely sir thank you for that answer and i think patient as well as the uh, attendees of the patient and the relatives they are also not very ready to accept that uh, the patient has got diabetes so uh, uh, one question that comes to my mind although uh, when is uh, initiating iv insulin protocol all the approved ones are the uh, human insulin regular as well as the uh, rapid acting analog but uh, does that make any difference as to which insulin uh, we are initiating in uh, iv insulin protocol no no frankly speaking no difference at all if you give what per if we go i won't go in details of the uh, whole 
PKPD of the insulin uh, therapy, but it is basically uh, whatever the duration of the drug is, uh, uh, the insulin is made. It uh, is all uh, it all uh, works when it is given in a subcutaneous plane. Whether whether we make it more stable, whether we make it uh, uh, more into the hexamers uh, or more uh, precipitation in some insulins, it is basically in the subcutaneous plane. If we give a longer acting insulin like glargine as an IV, it will work same as a rapid acting insulin analog or even a regular insulin also. So in IV, all insulin are same analogs few studies are there that yes rapid acting analogs may be better but they are not very convincing i would say a rapid acting insulin and a regular insulin in iv protocol at same so sir what's your choice regular or rapid acting See, <laughs> it, it all it all depends on the uh, availability uh, See, if somebody, if some uh, place and also the affordability also, you know, rapid acting insulin, we all know they are quite expensive, you know, almost two, two and a half times the cost, you know, or at least one and a half times. But regular insulin is equally efficacious also. So if you want, if somebody can really afford, definitely we can try with uh, the insulin analogs, rapid acting, but then otherwise regular insulin is most of the uh, uh, times my choice because it 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 offers the same benefit thank you thank you for that clarity sir and i think one very interesting point that you mentioned that before shifting the patient to the ward uh, the timing of uh, initiating at least a basal insulin i think uh, that is something what we see the four hours that is lost uh, after stopping IV uh, infusion. So if you can uh, again re uh, iterate mm -hmm. the same thing, I think that is a very good uh, yes. takeaway for uh, this lecture. Very, very important because we see our uh, junior doctor residents in the ICU settings. We say you stop insulin and start uh, a long acting insulin. And most preferably, I'm again and again saying long-acting insulin because those insulin in stable patients, they act very well to uh, take care of the variability. And then if required, we can give them bolus insulin in the wards also. So this transition time is very important. You know, we, we, we can manage it, but then it uh, uh, avoids the unnecessary panic. See, if you stop IV insulin, then in one or two hours, suddenly the, uh, there may be an increase in blood sugar levels of more than 300 or 400. But if you start the insulin, long-acting insulin like glargine, three to four hours before you stop, definitely it starts acting. It starts bringing the blood sugar levels down without any peaks and without any uh, fluctuation. So that basically avoids unnecessary panic for even the patient and for junior staff. I may realize, but then the junior staff or the paramedics may, and even the patient and their attenders may suddenly become this thing that, sir, after shifting the patient to what? Suddenly, blood sugar levels have increased, so it may just create unnecessary panic. Uh, thank you, thank you for that uh, uh, clarity on that uh, specific aspect, sir. Uh, sir, we have got a question from Dr. Swani Kayak: How to manage patients who are nil by mouth, have OT procedure for major surgery? Shall all patients should be given neutralization drip? Yes, I think when there is a, a hyperglycemia or if you are operating on a, a, a previously diagnosed diabetic patients on OHS or even or insulin therapy, yes, this uh, is observed as a standard procedure you know, so that the nutrition is maintained with the uh, dextrose infusion and the blood sugar levels are maintained with the insulin infusion. So, because we have to take care of both, the, 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 uh, the nutrition part also, we can't just keep the patient NPO and because the patient can go for the uh, ketosis also, 
if there is uh, only insulin and the the there is no uh, uh, the uh, sugar levels are not uh, appropriate in the patient because it's like we have to balance no hypos and no hypers thank you sir i think we'll take one last question sir okay. uh, uh, because keeping time in proximity Sure. Sir, sometimes it so happens that there is an emergency procedure and patient gets admitted at the night time. HB1C is uh, way too high, let's say 12 or 13 percent. And the procedure is uh, planned, let's say, next day morning. Usually that happens. Maybe it's a bypass surgery. Uh, how to manage such patients uh, when we are uh, preparing them? And uh, this is the clinical uh, scenario. See, again, I would say uh, the same scenario which we have discussed uh, uh, over last half an hour, uh, treat them as critical ill patients because they are really critical ill patients, you know, by awaiting CABG, so a lot of hemodynamic instability, a lot of metabolic electrolyte fluctuations in them. So in these patients, obviously, uh, IV uh, insulin protocol and a regular morning uh, monitoring, I would say hourly monitoring, if it is really that high, the HB1C first time diagnosed 12 or even in a diagnosed diabetic also, HB1C as high as 12 or something, patient going for a major surgery, patients hemodynamically very unstable, really critical ill patients, IV insulin protocol with hourly monitoring of blood sugar levels before the surgery, during the surgery. And as the last question was there, along with definitely a neutralizing drip also of dextrose. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. It was a, a really great listening to you and definitely it has been good for all our audience. Now, sir, uh, as we also understand that most of the patients uh, when they get uh, initially diagnosed during uh, their stay at the hospital. So, and uh, eventually when they're getting discharged, mostly they are on subcutaneous insulin. I'd just like to mention that we also have a patient support program for those patients, those who move on to uh, subcutaneous insulin. And before our vote of thanks, I'd like to invite Mr. Nenath Parekh who actually heads the patient support program to just to throw some light on uh, what a patient support program is. So, uh, Mr. Ninad, if you're there. Yeah, yeah. Good evening. Hello, I'm audible? Yes, yes, you are audible. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, sir. Uh, so, we are having Dysol as a patient support program. Okay. And if we are in Dysol, ideally we are providing the patient delivery demonstration blood glucometer and their demonstration and another that other we are adding uh, special, uh is in exercise and diet exercise exercise and diet that we are providing to the patients for the initial grooming for in insulin in patients so this kind of support we are providing we have a toll free number okay so patient can give the missed call and that toll free number then uh, within 24 hours, our team coordinates with your patients and are in the delivery and demonstration and take the follow-up also for repeat purchase and take care of their exercise and diet. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Nanath. So, sir, we from Vocart are doing our bit for the betterment of patient, what we can do. And uh, for the last part of this uh, wonderful webinar, I'd like to invite Mr. Vishwa Goro. Where's the marketing for us for the closing remarks and vote of thanks. So over to you, Mr. Vishwagoro. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kunal. And uh, thank you very much, Dr. Vijay Verma, sir. So before I uh, go for a vote of thanks, I, just, I would like to share something very interesting with you. That, sir, uh, now uh, in this year, we are completing 20 years of Vosalin. So Vosalin was launched in 2003 and put India on the global map of insulin manufacturers. Before Vosalin, the insulins were produced mainly in US and Europe. And India became the third country who started producing insulin. Sir. And uh, this Vosalin started manu getting manufactured in our Aurangabad facility, which was inaugurated by the then president of India, Dr. APJ Abdul Kalam, sir. So I would like to extend my gratitude towards the medical fraternity to you and to all the doctors who have supported Vosalin. And uh, now uh, 
again we are proud to say that Boston is now completing 20 years sir so thank you very much sir and uh, now i'll move forward for a uh, uh, word of thanks and uh, i would like to begin by expressing my deepest appreciation to dr abhidev verma sir for mm -hmm. his insightful and thought provoking presentations his expertise uh, and knowledge have enlightened us on a subject of utmost importance and i am truly grateful for your valuable contribution sir and i would like also like to express my heartfelt appreciation to all the delegates who have attended this webinar and truly your participation have added immense value to this gathering and i extend my sincere thanks to dr amarjeet and dr kunal for the exceptional moderation skills throughout the webinar and my special thanks to dr sanket and dr kunal again for uh, powering i trust webinar scientifically and a special mention goes to our ibb president mr amrit medical sir for his vision and leadership that made this webinar possible and my gratitude extends to lcs revishnu sir who is a cluster head of our diabetes business for its support and guidance in organizing this webinar so lastly i would also like to express my gratitude to the diabetes division field team and all my hr colleagues who have worked tirelessly behind the scenes to ensure the smooth execution of this webinar so at last signing off thank you very much for the continued support for i trust uh, webinar thank you very much thank you thank you everyone